Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. learners welcome to the session of managerial economics i am dr supriya jain working as an assistant professor in the institute of business management at gla university mathura so let's begin with our today's lecture and as you know we always uh, revise what we have covered in our previous session so here let us have a look on our discussion in our previous session we have talked about economies of scale as well as this economies of scale Economies and diseconomies of scales arises when we increase the operation, when we increase the size of output uh, in our organization and at working at the large scale we say that initially when companies increases their size of output they get several economies that means they are getting several advantages which helps in the reduction of cost. So here we have studied this heading economies of scale uh, in two categories one is internal and second is external. Internal economies arises because of the uh, size of the firm, right? At, uh, if you are working at the larger scale, then definitely you will be able to get certain economies which will help in the reduction of your average cost. Whereas external economies arises due to uh, size of the industry, not a firm, right? So whatever uh, benefit you are going to get uh, because of which your average cost reduces, that is not because of your own operating size, but the uh, size of the industry and the growth of the industry taking place. Whereas these economies are again you can say uh, the disadvantages which will be there when you further increase the size of your operation. Now here you will see that your average cost curve will not decrease it will rather go upward. Right. So, this happens when you unwidely spread your operation and the, there becomes a problem in the management. So, again internal diseconomies arises because of uh, you know large scale of operation of the firm whereas external diseconomies arises again because of the size of the industry not the firm. So, we have understood these concept of economies and diseconomies of scale and thereafter we have talked about economies of scope. Right. What scope a business firm is having if they are producing more than one product, right? how economically it will going to help them if they are going to start up with any kind of a complementary goods where they can use the similar inputs and the machine for the production of the another commodity. So here we have also talked about uh, the economies of scope and we can uh, we have also understood the relationship how we are going to start with the production of the combination. Uh, or you can say the product which can be uh, jointly demanded right and then lastly we have talked about cost and learning curve learning curve is basically helping us to understand by the way of learning by the way of doing right how we would be able to enhance our experiences our knowledge to do that work in a better way right we can uh, think of better uh, productions we can think of better methods and technologies which will help in the reduction of the cost so this was our discussion which we have made in our previous session right we have understood the concept of cost clearly so now in this class we are going to start with the production right what is meant by production right so let us look at the learning objectives of our today's session here you will be able to examine the economic analysis of firms technology which is used for different types of input and the process of production so here you will get an idea about what production is and how you can use these firms technology in the production of different commodities. It will also help you to develop an understanding to the distinction between the short run and the long run production function. Definitely like we have studied about the short run uh, and long run cost and output relationship here you will be able to understand how production is going to get work in short run as well as in the long run. And for the better understanding of the short run, you will be able to develop a critical appraisal of the law of variable proportion as well as law of return to scale. Thereafter, I will introduce you to the concept of isoquant. 
iso cost line marginal rate of technical substitution elasticity of substitution and expansion path so these are the headings which are going to be discussed in the session and you will get a clear idea how you will be question answers right so these are the uh, learning objectives of our session let us begin with the very first topic where let us first understand the meaning of production how are we going to understand what production is right simply if you want to define production is a process right what is production is production is a process of converting input into output right so that is what is basically called as production but if you are going to understand in a better form you can say that it is a transformation of resources right it is a transformation of resources into the goods and services right you have inputs now these inputs may be of no use but by the way of this production process you are converting them into goods and services which are having value and which will be able to satisfy the needs and wants of the customers so in other words you can say that production is an act of transformation of inputs into output okay which will help in the satisfaction of wants of people like for example input of sugar cane capital and labor are used to produce sugar right so sugar is basically the refined form uh, which we are using so how we made it we made it from the sugar cane as we all know this is the raw material used for making sugar and we are converting it by using the capital as well as resource uh, these labors right so production also includes production of services production does not only include the production of goods but it also includes the production of services like we have industries of uh, you know services we have lawyers we have teachers we have doctors so they are also providing services which provides uh, utility to the people right so in short you can say production is a process of transformation where we are transforming inputs into output and the purpose of transforming these inputs into output is to satisfy the needs and wants of the consumers okay so we have these definitions also for production given by economists so very first definition is given by james bates and parkinson according to them production is the organized activity of transforming resources into the finished good right so this is a process basically which you have organized how you are going to transfer the resources into the finished product in the form of goods and services and the objective of production is to satisfy the demand of such transformed resources so this is how we have understood the meaning of production also so i believe this definition is clear to everyone and looking at the second definition which is given by j r hicks production as any activity whether physical or mental which is directed to the satisfaction of other people want through exchange okay yes ob obviously to purchase these goods and services you have to make the payment right so there will always be an exchange taking place you can't avail these output or the services or goods which are been produced by the process of production definitely there will some ex uh, exchange taking place but whatever the activity you are producing whether it is physical or mental in the form of physical goods or in the form of services the satisfaction which you are going to derive out of it would be termed as production moving ahead we have production function now what is meant by this production function production function like we have talked about demand function we have also discussed about supply function so i believe now you will be able to understand how we are going to relate this production with the function for the production we requires factors of production okay because production cannot be possible without the factors of production and what are our factors of production we have land labor capital machinery right entrepreneur so these are all the factors of productions which we are using for converting our input into the output right so now we are going to understand how we are going to establish the relationship between the production and the functions on which the production is based so the functional relationship you can say between the physical input and physical output per unit of time under a given state of technology is called as production function right so how you are going to establish the functional relationship between the production and the factors of production 
within a specified period of time like it is already written per unit of time under a state of technology yes this is again very important for us to understand that production function we are defining with the given state of technology and how we are going to convert these input into the output with the available factors of production. So, it can also be expressed in the form of mathematical equations where you can say that output of any commodity is a dependent variable for obvious reason because it is the functions of other uh, variable and definitely the inputs are the independent variable. So, if you are defining it mathematically we are writing it like this quantity is the function of a, b, c and n right. So, these are the number of uh, factors of productions which we are using for our production purpose. So, where q denotes the quantity of the commodity that is uh, produced within the period of time right and f stands for the function and a, b and c denotes the various quantity of inputs which we are using to convert them into output ok. So, looking further with the production function and to understand it clearly and to apply it we have to make certain assumptions right. So, what are the assumptions which we are making for the study of reduction functions? The very first point says that it is specified with reference to a specified period, right. So, whatever we are having during that period of time, so it is very important to understand if we are defining the production function that has been defined for the specified period of time, right. So, time plays a very important consideration here. Secondly, we assume that the state of technology remains the same during the period. So, for the period for which we are calculating this production function, we assume that there is no change in the state of technology. Whatever the given technology is there, we are working with the same technology and there will be no change, right. So, this is the second thing which we are assuming. And the third point says that it is assumed that firm uses the best and the most efficient technique available in the production. Yes, this is again to get the best we are putting the best use of our resources and the best efficient technique which is available to us, right. So, that we would be able to produce the goods and services which are able to satisfy the maximum needs and wants and we would be able to get the best of our production. So, this is the assumption which we are making that the producers are behaving rationally and they are using the best and the most efficient technique of production available to them. And lastly, it is assumed that the factors of production like land, labor, capital, right, all these factors of productions are divisible into viable units, right. Then only we would be able to uh, establish this functional relationship between demand and its uh, factors ok or the inputs which we are going to use for the process of production right. So, I believe these assumption functions are clear to every one of us. Now, looking further how we are going to see that uh, production function is going to work as there is a always a specified period of time. So, we need to understand these production function keeping the different uh, time frame that is the short run as well as the long run. So, as we know uh, short run is a period where some inputs like plant, size, machine and equipments cannot be changed. This we have already understood that in short run we always have some inputs which are fixed in nature and we have some inputs which are of variable nature, right. Because short run again is a time frame which is not enough for us to change uh, to a new situation. So, when we talk about a plant size, right, overnightly we cannot change the size of our plant or it cannot be done within a day or two, it requires a considerable time, right. So, short run is a frame where uh, we assume that or, or we have to believe that plant size, machine, equipments, all these inputs are of, uh, you know, capital nature and the, these are the fixed factors which cannot be changed, right. Whereas, the other factors like raw material which we are using for the production of those goods are of or the labor you can say are of variable nature, right, which can be varied, which can be increased, right, uh, in a shorter period of time. So, uh, we can say that therefore, a producer trying to increase the output in the short run will, will be able to do so by increasing only the variable input. So, here we need to understand if a producer wants to increase the size of output in the short run then the only choice which left with the producer is to increase the variable inputs 
only to increase the size of output because we cannot make change to the fixed inputs. Fixed inputs in short run will remain same and whatever the change we are trying to make in the size of output that we are able to do with the increase in the variable input. So, on contrary you can say long run input options are very wide because long run is again uh, enough time for us to change to our new situation. So, in long run there will be no fixed input, all the inputs are variable. So, here you have better understanding and you have better uh, you know way of increasing the size of your output because all the inputs are variable. So, based on these characteristics of input production functions basically we are going to talk under two categories. The one is production function with one uh, variable input right when we are ho ha having only one variable input and the other input is fixed. So, this is what basically we are going to study the production function in the short run. And the second is when production function when we have two variable inputs, we have two inputs one is means both of them are variable ok, we can change both of them. So, because of this we have no fixed input in the long run. So, for this production function uh, with one variable input this can be clearly studied with the two laws where we have law of variable proportion and we do have law of return to scale right. Whereas, when we talk about production function with two variable inputs, we will talk about ISO cost curve, right. So, here further to understand these production function, when we have one variable, we will study these two law and when we have two variable input, we will study it with the help of ISO cost curve, right. So, now let us start with the very first where we are going to talk about production function with one variable input. Now, as you can clearly see this is the situation we are talking under the short run we have only one input which is of variable nature and the other input is fixed input. So, in short run producer must optimize with only one variable input ok whatever the uh, you know maximum optimization a firm can do it can do only with the increase in one variable input. So, for this understanding let us have one situation. So, let us consider a situation that there are two inputs ok, we are making an assumption say we have two input and these two input one of them is a capital and the other one is labor. So, what we have seen that our fixed input is capital ok or you can also denote it with k and our variable input is labor right. This is the uh, input which we can change labor size can be changed in the short run. But if we want to increase the size of our operation in the short run is not possible right. So, we have seen that capital is of fixed nature whereas, labor is a variable input. Now, you will note that as the amount of capital is kept constant right because here the capital is being constant the it cannot change right. So, the labor is increased to increase the output and the ratio in which these two inputs are used will also change. Suppose, initially we were using 1 is to 2 ratio of labor and capital. Being capital of fixed input we cannot increase the size of capital, we can only increase the size of labor to increase the size of output right. So, if suppose I have increased the labor being capital constant it is a fixed input. So, I have increased the labor. So, see the ratio will also change right. The ratio between these two variables will also vary because we are only making an increase in the variable input to increase the output and keeping a fixed input to be fixed right. So, therefore, any change in the output can be manifested only through a change in the labor input right. So, whatever the change is taking place in the output because of change in the labor input we can easily relate that that we have increased this variable and with the increase in the variable this output has been increased. So, that relationship can be easily find it out right. So, a production function is also termed as variable proportion production function because uh, this has been uh, you know based on the variable input. So, that is why this name has been given to it. It is also termed as variable from uh, proportion pr production function and it is essentially a short term production function because here we have one fixed input and fixed input concept is only applicable in the short run right. Now, let us uh, look at how we are going to write this production function with one variable q here is the quantity and as we have taken only two input one of them is labor and other one is capital. 
we are denoting capital with k here right fixed amount of capital as because this is the fixed input and this is the variable input now see whatever the change is going to take place in the quantity that is because of the labor because this is the variable input and capital being the fixed input this is not increasing right we are only increasing the size of labor to increase the size of output or our operation so this is how we define the production function with one variable now let us look at the total average and marginal productivity of factor input how are we going to find out see whatever the change we are making into our variable input so how this variable input is going to uh, you know affect the total average and marginal productivity of the uh, factor input right so assuming as we are assuming capital to be constant uh, this this bar need to be shifted here this capital needs to be constant uh, this is not here and labor is a variable input so you can see total productivity of labor since we are going to talk about labor only and this is the only variable which we are changing so the total productivity of labor is the function of capital and labor and where capital keeps fixed okay keep uh, being a fixed input whereas to calculate the average productivity of labor what we are going to do average we always divide the total by the uh, quantity right so average productivity of labor can be finded out by this simple formula where we are finding out the total productivity of the labor divided by the total number of labor we are using right and then we have marginal productivity so if you want to find out the marginal productivity of labor again this can be finded out by change in total product whatever the change has been taken place in the total output upon the change in labor right so one additional unit of labor if you have added to your uh, you know production then because of that what increase has been taken place in the output that will be called as marginal productivity of labor so these are the three important uh, consideration which you need to understand how are we going to calculate the total average and marginal productivity of a factor input right so now these are going to be studied further in this law of variable proportion how we are going to understand this law of variable proportion this is a part of production function with one variable which is applicable in the short run so short run production function as you know is governed by the law of variable proportion and we have also discussed why this law is called as variable proportion because here whatever the change is taking place in the output is because of the change in the variable input so here we have one example to make this clear to every one of you Uh, let us assume there is a manufacturer right and this manufacturer starts the production with the investment of 40 crores in the plant and machinery right this person has started his business by making an investment of 40 crores in the fixed input named as plant and machinery and the annual product of the firm is shown in the table i'll be showing you the table let us read out this what is written here so we can see that as a manufacturer increases the units of labor keeping the investment in the plant fix since we are talking about the short run so the investment which has been made by the manufacturer for this business is the 40 crore keeping this as a fixed input and we have on the other hand the labor where we are only increasing the size of labor to increase the size of output so here we have this uh, chart to make you understand about this law of variable proportion so now you can see Uh, we are not considering the uh, fixed input that is the capital because that will remain the same there will be no change taking place in it what we are doing here is we have written the labor in a unit form okay this is the total product marginal product and average productivity okay what change will be taking place in the total productivity average productivity and marginal productivity because of change in the size of the labor so when we have added one uh, when we were having one unit of labor so their productive total productivity was 20 there is no marginal productivity and again the average productivity of the labor will be same but as when you have added the another unit of labor being a variable input you can only increase the size of labor right you can only increase the size of variable input to increase your output so when you have initially added one unit of labor you can see the total productivity increases marginal productivity is 30 and your average productivity also increases now further when you added one more unit of labor 
again this total productivity increases, marginal productivity increases and average productivity also increases. So, you can see that this is the stage 1 which we are calling as an increasing return stage where when you are adding the successive unit of labor to it the productivity, total productivity, marginal productivity as well as average productivity of a labor keeps on increasing. That means a little change in the input will gives you higher change in the output. Now moving ahead when we further add labor or increase the uh, you know labor in our organization to increase the output, see our product productivity is still increasing but our marginal productivity starts to decline. Now it reduces from 40 to 30 and our average productivity remains the same in both the cases it is same right. Then further when we added to the fifth unit of labor our total productivity increased our marginal productivity is still uh, declining and average productivity also started declining. In the previous case it was same but now as you can see it is also started declining right. When we add the another unit of labor the total productivity is still increasing but now marginal productivity also decline and average productivity also decline. So basically what we are calling this stage, this stage would be called as a stage of diminishing return right. The returns you are getting that is in the diminishing form because the total productivity of that product is increasing, uh, of labor is increasing. But if you look at the marginal and average productivity of the labor it is declining right. So you can work up to this phase because still you are getting some return but uh, inputs are uh, you know proportionately uses where you are not getting more of the output but definitely you are getting some of the return to it. In the first case the output was uh, in a higher proportion, here the output you are increasing but in a lesser proportion that is why we call this a stage as an diminishing return stage. And lastly you can see here now if you are going to further increase the size of input right your total productivity will not increase. In the very first case you can see it remains the same and then thereafter it also started declining and the marginal productivity reaches to 0 right and it might reach to negative and here average productivity also keeps on declining. So this is basically the stage of negative return. So what we are trying to make you understand here is in short run like we have studied we have two inputs some of the, the, them are the fixed inputs uh, means one of them is the fixed input and the another one is the variable input and whatever the change we can make we can only make it to a variable input to change the size of output right and when being one input fixed and being the other input variable you increase only one of them then the proportion the ratio between these two inputs will change drastically. So initially it will give you the return which is uh, a very good return you are going to get which is not named as increasing return but thereafter your return starts declining right that is why you are getting the returns but in a diminishing form so we are calling it as a diminishing return but if you further increase it you will get negative returns rather than getting something positive it will give you a loss and that is why our average cost curve shapes like you right. So basically uh, you can say that uh, in short run these economies and uh, this economies does not mu much so no, work much but yes they are applicable more in the long run right. So if we, if we talk about from a consumer uh, from the producers point of view we can say that if we want to increase only the variable input to increase the size of operations then up to this point we can increase and we can go up to this point because here also we are getting the return maybe in a diminishing form we are getting but beyond this point we should not add further increase in a valuable input because from here maybe we are going to get the negative return. So this is how we understand the law of variable proportion which is applicable in the short run. So this is all we have discussed uh, with the explanation of the uh, you know table I have talked about right as we know that uh, in, in the variable proportion state that increase in the quantity of the variable factors marginal and the average product will eventually decline other inputs remain unchanged right. Moving ahead let us look at these graph right how we are going to plot this tabular representation of our law of variable proportion in the form of graph you can see we here we have total productivity we have average productivity and here we have marginal productivity. 
So, we have three stages right the first stage is of increasing return, the second stage is of diminishing return and the third stage is of negative return right. So, initially when we increase the variable factor see here on the y axis we are showing the output because the output will be changed because of change in the variable factor right. So, initially when we increase the size of labor we will get an increase in three of them total productivity will increase average productivity is also increasing and marginal productivity is increasing. But in the stage one we are also getting this point of inflection and this point of inflection says that up to this point there is a uh, you know increase in the total productivity which is uh, uh, you know very high right. It will increase at a increasing rate and thereafter it is increasing with the diminishing rate and then, then it also starts falling right. And if we talk about stage 2, stage 2 is the uh, stage which started with when average productivity is equal to the marginal productivity right. Your total productivity is greater than both, but here in this stage it will start from the point where your average productivity is equal to the marginal productivity. And your third stage starts where the marginal productivity is equal to 0 right, because you are not getting any additional benefit by adding further more successive units of the labor right. So, this is how we explain the law of variable factors um, through this graph and here we have all the three stages which are being explained as you can see in the increasing return to variable factor here in the first case marginal productivity is greater than 0 and marginal productivity was also greater than average productivity you can see this is the curve of marginal productivity and this is the curve of average productivity right. So, here in this case marginal productivity is greater than average productivity we are talking about the stage 1 of increasing return. Whereas, if you look at the second stage see what is written here now the marginal productivity is lesser than average productivity right. So, stage 2 where we are getting the diminishing return here your marginal productivity is lesser than the average productivity right and it starts from the point where marginal productivity was equal to the average productivity right and then if we talk about the negative return stage negative return is the stage where marginal productivity will be below than the 0 right because it, it goes to the negative right even if you are further going to add first it reached to the 0 point and if you are further going to add the labor to it then it might reach to negative. So, here total productivity also starts falling marginal productivity will lesser than be 0. So, you can say that stage 3 is technically an inefficient stage of production right we should not be uh, uh, you know uh, try to get into this stage because this is an inefficient stage unnecessarily we are increasing the size of uh, labor input, but we are not getting any return on our output. So, rational firm will never operate in this stage right. So, this is what uh, is being explained through this law of variable proportion to understand how we are going to plan out our production in the short run when we are having one fixed input and we have another variable input up to which point we should be increasing our variable input. So, as we would be able to get good returns right. So, stage 1 shows you the increasing return, stage 2 shows you the diminishing return and in the stage 3 if you are reaching and if you are operating trying to operate into this uh, stage then we will get negative returns right. So, to understand the production function with one variable we have uh, this law of variable proportion. Now, we are going to understand this production function with two variable input when we have two variable inputs and we can uh, you know change both of them we have no fixed input right both the inputs are variable then how we are going to uh, you know examine the results on the output. So, law of return basically helps you to the exact uh, helps you to examine the production function and the input output relationship in the long run where increase in the output can be achieved by varying the in, uh, units of all factors in the same proportion right. Here now you can change the capital you can also change the size of labor because we are operating in the long run and in long run no input is a fixed input. So, in long run all the factors become variable that we already know and it means that in the long run the scale of production and the size of firm can be increased. So, let us have a look 
to this law of return to scale right earlier we have talked about law of variable proportion where we have understood the production function with one variable whereas in law of return to scale we are going to talk about production function with two variables right so here we have uh, you know the units of labor and capital since they both are variable input so we can change the capital also and we can change the labor also and now here we are understanding with the change in the capital and labor both of them what return we are going to get right so if we have initially changed both capital and labor input and we have added one to it then in the first case marginal productivity and total productivity will remain same but and in the second step in the second step also when you have increased it further the marginal productivity is increasing and the total productivity is also increasing right when you have added the third unit to it the total pr marginal productivity is still increasing and total productivity is also increasing so this is basically the stage 1 which is going to give you the increasing return whenever you are making a change in the capital and the labor now further if you are going to make change in the capital and labor your marginal productivity will remain same it is not going to add any further uh, you know uh, productivity to it and still your total productivity is increasing but you can see your marginal productivity is constant right that is why the second stage is called as the return of constant return right the stage of constant return here whatever the return you are getting they are of constant nature means your size of output is increasing but your marginal productivity will remain same and that is why the stage 2 is been called as constant return then further if you are going to add any change into the labor as well as the capital your marginal productivity will decline and your total productivity is still increasing so we are basically relating it with the marginal productivity the additional unit of labor as well as capital are they uh, you know giving you any kind of return or not initially the returns are increasing secondly we are getting the constant return and in the third stage we are still getting the return but we are getting it uh, in a diminishing form right so you can see the difference between the law of variable proportion and law of return to scale they are because we were only increasing the variable input and the capital remained the fixed right so the uh, ratio between two changes uh, at every stage right so that is why we were getting the increasing return and very first stage would give you the diminishing return second stage and in the third stage there will be a negative return so in this law of return to scale since we have both the variable factors so we are increasing both of them capital is also increasing and labor size is also increasing so here we will get the returns but definitely our return will be different like here we are getting increasing return here we, whatever the returns we are getting are of constant nature and here also we are getting the return but they are of uh, they have been called as diminishing return so you are not working in any of the uh, you know negative situation where you are not getting any sort of return your return will be there but definitely uh, the return uh, will be different at different stages right so increasing return of sales says that you have increased the input by 10% a lesser change in the input gives you the more change in the output right uh, means small amount of change you have made in the input and the return which you are going to get uh, in in the form of output will be change uh, very much or, or it will change uh, to the higher percentage right whereas constant return of scale says that you are increasing the size of input by 10% and output also rises by the 10% means same return you are getting right that is why we call it as in constant return okay uh, the, the 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 size of input you are in, in increasing the same um, uh, change is going to take place in the output right whereas in the form of diminishing return you can say you are you increasing more of the input and your output rises only by 10% means here more of input are being used to increase the size of output but in a percentage you can see it will be lesser than the change in input so i hope it is clear how we are talking about the returns we are going to get when we are producing with the two variables when we can change both of them we are getting the return but initially with the lesser uh, you know inputs we are getting more return in the second stage we are getting the same return uh, the uh, you know the percentage increase we are making in the input the same percentage change is going to take place in the output whereas in the diminishing return 
a more change you are making in the input, but the lesser effect you are getting into the output, right? And this is how we basically, uh, you know, draw this uh, curve of uh, law of return to scale. Here you are getting the increasing return. The, uh, this shows the constant return to scale, and this shows the decreasing return to scale, right? So these are the different stages which we can see and we can draw graphically, right? On the x-axis, we have shown the labor and capital because these are the inputs uh, where we have made the variation and we have seen the change on the marginal productivity, right? Initial stages, we have seen the marginal productivity increases, then it become constant and then thereafter it started decreasing, right? Now, let us talk about the production optimization, right? These are the two functions which we have studied, production function with one variable where we have talked about law of variable proportion, whereas the second was your production function with two variables where we have seen the uh, law of return to scale. Now we are talking about the production optimization. See, the ultimate objective of a, produ a producer is to optimize the available resources because they want to produce the output, how much output they want to produce and how they are optimally utilizing the resources they are having, that actually matters. So, isoquant are the ways whether we are going to understand the optimization, how producers get their optimization and this isoquant is basically a Greek word which comprises of two things, one is called as iso and the other called as quant. Iso means equal and quant means the quantity, right? Equal quantity or how we are going to get the equal quantity by using the different combinations of our input right to produce a given level of the output. With this you can see here, here the quantity is fixed in the uh, C uh, for the law of variable proportion when we have seen, we, we have seen that in that quantity is the function of labor and capital and in the short run capital being a fixed input remain fixed right. In law of return to scale we do not have any of the fixed input, we can make a change in labor as well as in capital. But here in the isoquant what we are saying, the quantity is given, quantity is fixed that we need to produce up to this much of output and how are we going to uh, produce this much of output with the different combination of input. So here we can uh, increase the size of labor also and we are also increasing the size of capital or you can say the combination which we are using for labor and capital to produce the given level of output. So for that we are going to understand this isoquant curve, right? So, isoquant curve can be studied with this table, how we are going to draw it and what is meant by isoquant. You can see he, here we have the, uh, you know, combinations which we are going to plot on the graph and this column shows the output. Like I said, output is given, it is constant. Here you want to produce 200,000 tons, again in the second it will be same, third, fourth and fifth. What are you doing here is? you are using the different combinations, right? You are using the different combinations of capital and labor to produce the same level of output, right? Here suppose you have 40 crores of labor uh, capital and you have 600 unit of labor to produce uh, 200,000 tons of output, right? So what you have done for increasing the labor size, you have reduced the capital. So, this combination will also produce this much of output, this combination of labor and capital will produce this much of output. So, you are saying that we are using capital and labor as in substitute for each other. If we are sacrificing one of the factor, then we are increasing the another, right? So, uh, to basically have a same level of output, this choice can be made by a producer what combination uh, the producer wants to use for the given input to produce the given level of output, right? And this is how we basically show the ISO cost curve or ISO quant curve, right? ISO being equal and quant means the quantity. On the X axis we have labor and on the Y axis we have capital. Since we are using the different combination of labor and capital to produce the given level of output and like I said, we are treating these two, uh, you know, inputs as an substitute of each other where if we are using more of capital, then we are using less of labor and if we are using the less of capital, we are increasing the size of labor, right? So the curve which we are going to get is called as isoquant curve, right? Now let us look at the properties of isoquant curve. How are we going to uh, study this isoquant curve 
and here I would like to help uh, you know uh, you want to recall that we have talked about indifference curve also when we have talked about utility concept right there in the utility concept and when we have talked about ordinal utility we have seen the indifference curve how a consumer remains indifferent between the combination of two goods and what combination they are using so as they would be able to satisfy their maximum needs and wants. Same is the case of the isoquant here the uh, producer we are talking from the producers point of view and there we were talking from the consumers point of view right. So, how producer is going to combine these two input in a manner where the producer is able to optimize its production ok. So, the very first point says that isoquants will always be downward sloping like we have seen the curve of isoquant this is downward sloping curve which uh, represents that both the product x as well as y not products, but the inputs rather I should say here because we are talking about production right. So, x input and the y input are being used as the substitute of each other if we are using more of y then we are using less of x we are using more of uh, less of y then we are using more of x. So, these are the basically different combinations we are making out. So, as we would be able to produce the given level of output right. So, the very first property says that isoquants will always be downward sloping. Second is higher isoquants will represent the higher output right. So, again this is one isoquant if I draw the another uh, isoquant over it then we can say the highest uh, uh, the, the topmost isoquant this is isoquant 1, this is isoquant 2, this is isoquant 3 and this is isoquant 4. So, this isoquant 4 is going to give you the maximum uh, you know output higher output the more will be the uh, isoquant the higher will be the isoquant higher will be the output definitely because at this point you are using more of input y and you are also using more of input x right. Next is isoquant will never intersect. So, as if we are drawing the isoquant we are drawing them parallelly right we cannot say that the isoquant will intersect like this no they will never intersect there, 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 there is no point of intersecting between the isoquant curve because the inputs which we are making right we are very much clear how we are going to use the different combinations of these inputs because of the marginal rate of substitution is there and we are clear with how much capital and labor we are going to combine to make uh, you know the given level of output. So, that is why the isoquant will never intersect right because this signifies that single input combination producing two level of output and then lastly we are saying isoquants will always be convex to the origin right. This is how we draw this isoquant curve this is the convex shape and if you would be drawing it this way then it will give it a shape of concave. So, it is not a concave shape it is a, con a convex shape which says that uh, the products are two products cannot be sub perfect substitute of each other right. Uh, this is the shape given to them they are being treated as in substitute, but in general we cannot say that the capital is a substitute of labor or labor is a substitute of a capital. Though we are defining different combination of these two commodities, but they are not the perfect substitute of each other right. So, this is how we basically understood what is meant by isoquant. Isoquant is basically used when a given level of output is being produced with the different combinations of input right. We can make a change in both the inputs because this is again applicable in the long run, but here you need to make sure what combinations you are using to attain the given level of output right and for the clear understanding of isoquants we have seen the different properties that it will always be downward sloping higher isoquant will represent the higher output it will never intersect each other and they will always be convex to the origin. Then let us talk about the isocost line what is meant by isocost line uh, students if you recall back we have also talked about the budget line right as because consumers have a constraint of their income. So, income uh, of a person draws the budget line same is the case producers also have their own budget of producing any commodity right. So, they need to understand 
how much commodity, uh, how much output they can produce with the given level of the input. So, this isocont line is basically the locus of point of all the different combination of labor and capital and the firm can employ for given total cost and price of the input, right. So, whatever the cost is going to be in, uh, involved, you need to understand your ISO cost line that this is the area which is feasible for you. You can here use the different combinations of given input and that is the point which you cannot use because you do not have that much of resources available to you. So, ISO cost line is basically helping you to define that boundary within which you need to uh, use the different combinations of input which are available to you uh, available to you so that you will be able to optimize them to the maximum right so this is what is basically meant by iso cost line and how this iso cost line help you to draw this producers equilibrium right so producer equilibrium is a uh, you know is a uh, stage where producer is in the equilibrium form right where producer is able to utilize the available resources to the maximum point uh, which he or she can opt with the given budget or with the given ISO cost line, right. So, one thing which is important to keep in the mind that production function describes technology not economic behavior, right. When we are talking about production function, it is defining the technology, the given uh, state of technology we are having, but it is not defining the economic behavior of a person. And as we know, isoquan would show all technically efficient combination, okay, the different combinations which we have made on the isoquants, they are all technically efficient combinations, whether we choose A, we choose B, we choose C or D. These are the technically efficient combinations which can be used to produce a given level of output, right. But when producers are faced with several technically efficient combinations, the decision is basically based on the economic efficiency. So, these are all the technically efficient combinations which are already available to us. But, but when we have these all technically efficient combinations, what we will do? We will make our decision based on economic efficiency that is the use that combination which minimize the cost of production okay all these combinations are available to you which you can use but definitely you are going to choose that combination where the cost of production will be minimum so ultimately produ uh, producers focus will always be on the reduction of cost how are we going to go ahead with the output what combinations of input should be utilized so that a firm is able to minimize their cost of production and they would be able to maximize their size of output. So, for that we are talking about this producer's equilibrium. So, hence to be economically efficient, a producer must determine the combination of inputs that produce the output at the minimum cost because ultimately the focus is on the reduction of cost. So, a profit maximizing firm will try to use a combination of input that will minimize its cost of production at a given level of output, right. So, if a output level is being given to you and you are using the different combinations of input, then you need to understand how you are going to combine these two inputs which are technically efficient as well as economic efficiency should also be there where you would be able to minimize the cost. Right. Now, looking further, we have this, uh, you know, producer equilibrium curve, where I will uh, make you understand how we are uh, going to uh, talk about the slope of ISO quant and also talk about the slope of ISO cost line. This is the ISO quant you have already seen. This is the ISO quant curve, which shows the different combination of goods which can be produced, right, which can be produced. Uh, for the given level of output. Whereas, we have ISO cost line which is defined as a budget line for a producer how much resources a person can employ. Suppose, if we see that this is the budget, this is the ISO cost line for a consumer uh, for the producer because this is a producer equilibrium curve, right. So, this is the ISO cost line 
out of this line if we talk about this r point and this t point this is not feasible because our I, our budget is beyond that point uh, our budget is not beyond that point this is basically the unfeasible area and this is the feasible area where we can have the different combinations of good like labor and capital right so at the point m we can say the producer is an in a, is in a equilibrium position because if they are using below to this that means they are not utilizing their resources efficiently right they have more resources but they are not utilizing those resources efficiently so ideally below this point uh, any any point will not work so at the point where iso cost curve and iso cost line uh, you know touch each other that point would be called as producers equilibrium point right this is the producers equilibrium point right so up to this point if the producer is working then they are going to get the maximum optimization and for that reason we are uh, you know studying this producer equilibrium point where you would be able to find out where, where the producer is able to find out up to which point they should produce or what combination of given uh, commodities they should make so that the cost of production will be minimum right the focus is on the reduction of the cost because the different combinations we are making they are being made based on the technical efficiency but the decisions what we are making regarding the production that is also including the economic efficiency how economically we are using these combination so in a diagram we can see that all the combinations r m t can produce 200 unit of output right either we use this r point or m or t point these are the different combinations are given right and with these combination either we are using r we are using m or we are using t we can produce 200 unit of firms and we'll try to find out the least cost combination so for this it will superimpose the various isoquants line on the isoquants as shown in the diagram so where the iso cost line is equals to the isocot curve right so that is basically the combination which we are representing with the m and this is the least cost combination as here isoquant is tendent to the iso cost line right so you can also read out here marginal rate of substitution for x and y right marginal rate of substitution we are talking about how much we are substituting one input over for the another input like we have labor and capital so how are we substituting them uh, with each other for that we study about the marginal rate of substitution so price of x input and the price of y input we understand this combination and accordingly we make out the uh, you know technical as well as economic efficiency combinations right so this is for our today's class if we revise the topic if you review the topic what all we have discussed in our today's session we have talked about production production is basically uh, the act of transformation we have seen how we are transforming the inputs input into the output then we have talked about the production function production function is the function of the given inputs right through which we can start with our production then we have talked about production function with one variable right when we have two inputs one is the fixed input and the other one is variable input so how we are going to increase the variable input to increase the size of output and this we have studied through the law of variable proportion variable proportion law help us to understand up to which point we can increase our variable input where we would be getting the increasing return at which stage we will get the return you know diminishing return and if you have further keep on adding a variable input only to increase the size of output then might be we are getting the negative returns right so this law is very much helpful in the short run to understand how a producer is going to increase the size of output whereas if we talk about production function with two variable right this point basically comes under the production function with two variable that is law of return to scale law of return to scale is used to understand how we are going to use the different uh, you know combinations right how we are because here in this law of return to scale no input is a fixed input they both are variable we can increase the capital also and we can increase the labor also right so how much increase is going to take place in the output this again with this law we have uh, studied the three different stages 
in the very first stage we have seen a lesser change in the input will causes more change in the output that is the increasing return stage whereas in the second stage we have see, uh, seen the same change right the percentage we are going to increase in the out input the same percentage change is going to take place in the output and that is why that stage is been called as the constant return stage right and the third stage here also we are getting the return but returns in a diminishing form where we are using more of the inputs and the outputs which are being increased is comparatively lesser to it right and then we have talked about iso cost curve iso cost curves also help you to understand the different combinations of input which can be used to produce a given level of the output right various properties of iso uh, quant curve we have discussed we have talked about the iso cost line iso cost line is the given budget for a producer for the production of goods and services and how consumer will be able to reach out its equilibrium so the producer is able to reach out to its equilibrium position where uh, you know uh, the the producer is going to use the optimum utilization of the resources and this equilibrium reaches to the point where slope of iso cost curve and iso cost line is equals to each other so this is all for our today's session uh, these are some reference books for the session uh, we have discussed thank you all of you